Okay, if you did not, I hope this will refresh your memory as to how to make sautéed shrimp Glasgow. Now, I have a third of a cup of oil over here in the frying pan, and I've heated it up, and I've got a tablespoon of very finely chopped up uh, minced onion, and two finely chopped minced cloves of garlic. And I'm going to put some heat to that, and we got to saute it just a minute or two, just until it's uh, kind of translucent. And then we'll add the other ingredients, which will be the seasonings, some salt, pepper, and thyme, as you see there. But the main thing now is to get this so we get the essence of the garlic and the onion. We're going to have all kinds of essences in here. Uh, you see it calls for a couple of tablespoons of scotch whiskey. Uh, of course, we're going to saute this on top of the stove, and the alcohol is going to boil away. Uh, that's just one of the many flavors that go into this recipe that we'll have on the shrimp, including the garlic, the onions, the thyme, uh, and the lemon juice, and a little bit of everything. A very delicate but marvelous blend of taste, and everybody that I've ever served this to uh, just raves about it. Now, that looks like it's getting about right there, and I'm going to turn it down just a little bit. Salt and pepper it to taste, and put in about a quarter of a teaspoon of uh, thyme leaves, and again, let it go for about another minute. There we go, about a quarter of a teaspoon there, wouldn't you say? And we let it go again, like this. Okay. Now this has to go about a minute so we get that whole essence in there. And in order to save time, what I'm going to do is just take a break here right now. I'll slow this down. I won't let it go two minutes, but I'll, uh, uh, we'll take a break here right now. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes after these very important messages. Camille Bradford. For the next couple of minutes, we're going to be talking with Janet Timmerman. Janet is chairperson of the Junior League of Columbia's cookbook committee. And Janet, the name of the cookbook is Putting on the Grits. I believe it's the first project of its kind for the Junior League. And just tell us what the cookbook features. We have over 500 um, twice-tested recipes, and we are featuring um, Columbia restaurants, we have basic southern classic recipes, and uh, we have an entertaining section to help you plan uh, your menu and, and party ideas. I was noticing in flipping through that it offers a lot more than just your basic recipes. It really enables you to, in, to plan an entire evening of entertainment around the cookbook and gives you some very, very helpful suggestions. Um, it has so much to offer, it must have taken you quite a, a long time to put the entire book together. How long did you work on it? This has been a two-year project. And we uh, gathered recipes for a year, and then it took us one year in putting the cookbook together. And it is on sale in Columbia. How can people purchase one? We um, have it in about 25 bookstores and gift shops throughout the Columbia area. But if they are unable um, to purchase it that way, they can order it um, through our cookbook office at 4600 Forest Drive, Suite 4, Columbia, South Carolina. 29206 is our zip code. I know the response has already been tremendous to the cookbook. Very briefly, where will the proceeds go? Our proceeds all go back into the community to support um, um, projects that, that we have ongoing. Thank you, Janet Timmerman, for being with us and talking about the Junior League of Columbia's new cookbook. Thank you. Okay, we've got a nice uh, kind of a broth here of, of uh, onion and, and seasoning, salt and pepper and thyme and garlic. And to that, we will add two teaspoons of lemon juice and two tablespoons of scotch and a pound of shrimp. 
And we're just going to saute those about five or six minutes. Uh, just, you know, you don't want to overcook them. Depends on the size of them and everything. But if they're nice big shrimp, but something like five or six minutes. And as I say, for those of you who do not imbibe, the, uh, the alcohol in the scotch will boil away. But what you're going to have here is an essence. And one of my favorite recipes and the one that I get real raves about. Uh, I've just come back from a trip up into West Virginia. I love to go up there. That mountain state is really beautiful. I've got a couple things I want to show you here today. First of all, I want to show you some of the mountain trout fishing. And then I want to talk about one of the most curious phenomenons I've ever encountered, a thing called rubber creeks. Uh, that's right. You heard it right, rubber creeks. And I'm going to show you the rubber creeks second, but first, Let's go now up into the mountains of West Virginia to some of those beautiful trout streams. We're going to fish today with three guys uh, that agreed to carry me up there, Charlie Hartwell and another guy named Jack Bell. And uh, this is Charlie Hartwell. Charlie is in charge of all the cold water hatcheries in the state of West Virginia. He's with the Department of Natural Resources. This is Jack Bell. Jack uh, is with a timber company up there. He buys cross ties for our timber company that treats them and then sells them to the railroad. This is a uh, March Brown that we're going to be using, and this is a thing called a trough caddis. We started off trying fly fishing. Uh, it was sort of an overcast day, in and out. The third guy in our party is Denzel Courtney. You've met Denzel here before many times. He's a biologist with the Department of Natural Resources, and he is stationed at Fairmont in West Virginia. And he has been very kind to the show here. Uh, now there's a weird looking thing, uh, a woolly worm that after Jack had fished a while and hadn't gotten a rise, there was a hatch coming off. What really uh, kind of puzzled us on this particular day, uh, sulfur stone flies, or yellow stone flies were hatching off. Uh, May is beautiful in West Virginia as it is in many places of the world, but the flowers were blooming up there. And there was a nice hatch coming off. I mean, just a solid, steady hatch. That was one that flew by the camera there. There's the one at the bottom of your picture, uh, a yellow sulfur. Uh, there's another one near the bottom of your picture, just sitting there on the rocks. They, they come out of the water. They hatch out of nymphs, climb out on the rocks, dry off, and then they fly away. And I was having a hard time keeping up with some of them. They were quicker than my eye with the camera. But maybe you got to look there. A little bright yellow looking flies. But the fish didn't seem to be taken on top on that particular day. Uh, here's some more flowers that we saw. Uh, when you don't catch fish, take pictures of flowers, I always say. Well, we decided we'd switch creeks. We didn't do anything. That was Shaver's Fork near the town of Elkins. We moved over to Harmon, which is further up in the mountains. And this is called Dry Run. Now, it's called Dry Run because in certain times of the year and certain conditions of drought, the upper reaches of it will actually dry up. But uh, it was in pretty good shape on this particular occasion. West Virginia had been going through that same drought that a lot of us uh, further south had been going through. But the river was in pretty good shape. And he's got a nice native brown. Now Shaver Fork is a, Shaver's Fork is a stock creek. This is a, a native or wild stream. They stock it a little bit, but not very much. And most of the fish that you catch in dry run, or the dry fork as it's called, are native fish. And this was about a 10 inch native brown. It also has native rainbows. Charlie was fishing a nymph. He is an expert at nymph fishing. It's a fly that goes down in the water. It's weighted and they add weight to it on the line above. And they were taking turns at the pools. Jack was, uh, he'd fish the quieter stretches with dry fly and he'd leave the riffles, the rapids, like this section to Charlie to go with the nymphs. It's a beautiful creek, river, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of small for a river, but it's large for a creek. But it's called Dry Fork, and this is very near the town of Harmon, just a few miles from there. That little rainbow jumped all over the nymph that Charlie was fishing. These are 10, 12. 14 inch fish, nice fish. We caught one, a rainbow at another creek that I'm gonna show you here in a minute that was really a nice fish. But this is a native fish. This is a native rainbow. Again, 10, 11 inches, somewhere in that neighborhood. Delightful to catch on a fly rod. 
Fly fishing is not so much catching fish as it is being out there and, and outwitting the fish and having them on your line, tussling with them, but smelling the air, looking at the flowers, and just having a general all-around good time. That's the main thing that trout fishing is about. And they've got some good trout fishing in West Virginia. A great deal of the water is stocked. Now this is a March brown nymph. He crawled out on a rock there, and that's what he looks like. Uh, he'll hatch out into a brown uh, mayfly, willow fly, whatever you want to call it, but he'll hatch out into a, a, uh, a brown fly called a March brown. Well, we moved on to Seneca Rocks. This is Mouth of Seneca in West Virginia, and we're on the north branch of, uh, of the north fork of the south branch of the Potomac River. This water goes right to Washington, D.C., and it's the north fork of the south branch of the Potomac, and Denzel was casting there. Uh, Jack's got a little chub that he caught. This is a beautiful stream. For some reason, inexplicably, it was up. They must have had a, a nice rain up in the mountains right above it here, and it was above normal, but still very clear and beautiful, but the fish were deep, and we had to go down to them with deep-weighted nymphs, and actually what Denzel, uh, Denzel caught these fish with uh, was uh, a jig head that he ties that looks kind of like a, a muddler minner, except it's tied with gold tinsel. And I'll show it to you in a minute. Here it is. And it's very heavy. It's very hard to cast. You've got to be an expert fly fisherman to cast this thing. But when you cast it into a pool, it goes deep. And when you go deep, when the fish are not feeding on top, and you go deep, quite often this is what you catch. And this is about a 16-inch rainbow a beautiful fish, one of the prettiest that we caught on the whole trip. And nothing more fun than to catch a fish like this. This stream, the North Fork of the South Branch, here at uh, Mouth of Seneca, at Seneca Rocks, is a that's a fish for fun stream you uh, all the fish that you catch there you can't keep them now they're stocked also but it is a fish for fun kind of stream and you get to catch the fish and play with them but you have to turn them back as a consequence you're more apt to catch larger fish there also they're a lot more sophisticated a great many of them have been caught a great number of times and they're a little smarter than the average fish and you got to be a good fisherman to out with them but uh, that's three different kinds of streams that we fished. We fished a stock stream where you can take the fish. We fished a native stream where you can take the fish, but where they are wild. And then we fished uh, the uh, catch them for fun stream over at Seneca Rocks. And in every place that we went, the scenery was absolutely gorgeous. And it was in Maine, the flowers were blooming, it was a great time. Well, there's my uh, sauteed shrimp Glasgow. And believe me, it catches rays. Now what you want to do with it is have a salad, you know, and a wine if you like, or whatever, but you want lots and lots of Italian bread or French bread to sop with. And you pour this out when you serve it. You pour it out in little bowls, little individual servings, however much you make, and you sop up the juice with the bread while you're eating the shrimp. So if you'll please pay attention to these very important messages, uh, I'll sop for a couple of minutes. I always have my spice box for each Southern Sportsman taping because a lot of my recipes call for seasoning, but here's a product that does away with choosing the right seasonings. House Autry Seafood Breader Mix. It has all the ingredients, milk, eggs, flour, cracker meal, and the spices. When the fish comes out of the shaker bag, it's ready to fry. Folks all over the South are using this House Autry Seafood Breader Mix. Try it if you want really mouth-watering fried fish. From House Autry Mills, Newton Grove, North Carolina. In my hometown of Greenville, North Carolina, there's a place called Overton's. Overton's is the world's largest water sports dealer, and this is their 1985 discount catalog. Anything and everything that the boater will need is in this book. Whether it's water skis or life vests, fishing tackles, shotguns, or crossbows, Overton's in Greenville has it at discount prices. Call them today toll-free for your new free catalog, or stop by when you're in Greenville. The prices and selections are super. Tell them Frank sent you. What's so different about the Happy Jack 3X flea collar? It works. 
Manufacturers of animal health products for over 38 years, Happy Jack has achieved a dramatic breakthrough in canine preventive health care. The Happy Jack 3X flea collar contains a completely new active ingredient which kills fleas for 11 months, ticks for 7 months, and mange mites. Protect your dog and home year-round with the Happy Jack 3X collar. Save an expensive trip to the animal clinic and a costly visit from the exterminator. Ask for Happy Jack. <laughs> your dog would. This is my partner at the Southern Sportsman Restaurants, Bobby Carraway. What are you cooking? I'm making a hangtown fried. What about you? Fried quail. You could have made the trout Delmonico. Well, you could have cooked spicy broiled trout. Well, you could have fixed the baked rabbit supreme. Well, you could have cooked shrimp thermidor. The fried frog legs. You could have cooked sweet and sour duck. The clam stuffed mushrooms. Merry old soul. The seafood plant. Food at the fried Southern shrimp, Sportsman Restaurants is worth arguing about. Steak. When are you going to cook venison stew? Well, West Virginia is coal mining country, of course. Uh, it has uh, suffered some problems with pollution in recent years, but they've done marvelous things since 1970 when the Reclamation Act was passed in uh, bringing it back. <clears throat> they have a, another serious problem up there, and that's unemployment. West Virginia has one of the highest unemployment rates uh, that we have any place in the country. And that's mostly because, uh, A, for a while coal mining was down, but if you pay attention to the economic news, you may not know, but last year uh, they sold more coal out of West Virginia into the rest of the nation and the world uh, than at any time since, I think, 1974. The coal industry is coming back. But the way they are mining it now doesn't leave it near as many jobs as they used to have up there. They have a machine that goes underground, and it just has a crew of two or three guys that, that goes with it, and it's called long wall mining. Now, they mark off a grid about a mile square, and they go through there in a 600-foot wide swath underground. This machine just cuts out all the cold as it goes, and they don't bother to brace it up with timbers and things like that like we used to. It's designed, if it wants to fall in behind them, fine. It, it just, they just go ahead and let it fall in. Then they'll leave 300 feet, and they'll step over, and they'll do another 600-foot swath a mile long. Well, working along underground like that, they come under houses, they come under pastures, they come under streams, and particularly where they come under streams, they don't want the water to break through into the top of the mine and flood it. So what they have begun to do in West Virginia is something I've never seen any place else in my life. I was fascinated by it. I was a little appalled by it too, but I was fascinated by it. They line the creek beds with rubber. They may be a half a mile or a mile or more of rubber that they lay in this creek so that the water won't go through the bottom of the creek when the machine goes under the creek. So I thought I'd show you this. They told me where I could find some of these. I had heard about it, and I said, look, I'd like to go see one of these things. This is uh, Goose Creek in northern West Virginia, and that's all rubber that you're seeing there now. Now, somewhere under here, there's a mine, and they don't want the water from this little creek to come down. I don't know what they would do. I imagine they avoid the very large rivers because rubberizing a big river would be a problem. But this is just a, a, a rubber trough or whatever you want to call it. And uh, here at Goose Creek, I'm going to show you four different streams. I'm going to show you one that's in a tube. In fact, I'll show you two that's in a tube. I'll show you one 36 inches in diameter that's in a tube. And then I'll show you a tributary of that one that's in a 12 inch tube. But uh, some people in West Virginia are, are sort of uh, crestfallenly, I mean, I sardonically or sarcastically or whatever you want to call it, refer to these as rubber creeks. But fishing in a rubber creek is not too much fun. Now, there's tadpoles there. But what they're doing is trying to keep the water from going into the top of the mine, so they have to pump all the water out. But this is what you get on the landscape. And this is Goose Creek. Now I'm going to show you a tributary of it here in just a minute in a three-foot rubber tube. Goose Creek, this was during the drought. If you remember, they didn't have much rainfall. And being in that hot rubber trough anyway, most of that water evaporated out. That creek wasn't running. Here's another little creek. You can't see it because it's in a tube. It's in a three-foot diameter rubber tube just laying across the country. And uh, there you see it. There it goes. And I'll show you here in a minute, I'll show you the tributary first, the 12-inch tributary that comes into it. 
but there were raccoon tracks down the top of this creek. I don't know whether the raccoon was just trying to get from one place to the other and found out that this was a neat way to go or whether he was actually looking for water. I don't know what he was after, but there were raccoon tracks all down the top of it. This is the 12 inch tributary and it comes down the mountainside and joins the 36 inch tributary and they go along their merry way. And here it is again. Maybe you can see those little dust tracks right there on the top, right there in the foreground. That's where a raccoon went strolling along uh, some night, probably, trying to find out what was going on. I guess he was saying, I wonder if I can fish in this creek. Well, it's hard to fish in a rubber creek, especially when it's in a tube. This is Jake's Run. This is a big creek. And I actually saw smallmouth bass cruising around on the rubber bottom in here. I guess they were looking for a place to spawn, but there's not many places to spawn in a rubber creek. Well, I've got some friends that are biologists in the Department of Natural Resources, and I went back and I said, well, you guys show me a real creek. I'd like to see a creek that's got water in it. And so they said, yeah, we'll take you up to Buffalo Creek. It's one of the creeks that has been reclaimed. At one time, Buffalo Creek near Mannington, West Virginia, was seriously polluted. Frank Janasik in the red shirt here on the right, Denzel Courtney in the middle, Jim Evans on the left. They all three are biologists, and I've met them all up there. And after having spent the afternoon just driving around the countryside by myself, looking at the rubber creeks, uh, I went back to town and when they got off at five o'clock, they said, come on, we'll take you. So this is late in the afternoon. Buffalo Creek has smallmouth bass and rock bass, brim, and a lot of coarse fish like carp. But it really is a pretty little creek, and it's an example of what can be done and what has been done in many places in West Virginia. Uh, I'm just as pleased and proud about seeing this creek as I was disturbed and appalled at uh, seeing the rubber creeks. But that's, uh, that's industry. There's a little rock bass that Frank Janasik has. Frank is an avid biologist uh, and animal lover and he is particularly a herpetologist, a study of, studier of snakes, and is the only man I know personally who keeps a cobra for a pet. But he has a king cobra in his house. I don't visit Frank very often. Uh, I like him, he's a nice guy, but I meet him at the restaurant or down at the coffee shop or someplace like that. I don't hang around his house where that cobra is. Nor do a great many other people that know the cobra's there. One of these days a burglar's gonna break into that house and be seriously surprised when he runs face to face with that cobra. But this is Buffalo Creek near Mannington, West Virginia, up in the northern part of West Virginia, up in the heart of the cold country, not too far actually from Pittsburgh, Morgantown, up in that area. And Denzel's got a little smallmouth bass here. But it was quite refreshing to go out that afternoon and see this after wandering around looking at the rubber creeks. Jim's got a little fish here. There's some larger fish in there, but it was hot afternoon and, and we didn't stay till dark. Probably if we'd stayed until deep dusk, we would have caught some of the larger fish that are in here. The main thing I wanted to do was just get my toes wet in cool water. And so that's what I did when, when I went back there. It's legal to do that in West Virginia. They call it subsidence, 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 whatever you want to call, but it's legal to subside. But people have found their swimming pools cracked in half and the water gone, wells have gone dry, rooms have fallen off of houses, houses have had to be moved and put up on steel foundations and everything where the ground falls uh, behind these machines that are crawling along their underground. And uh, all the company has to do is repair the damage. They can do anything they want to so far as digging the coal, but they do have to repair the damage uh, if there is any as they go along. Uh, well, that's the Rubber Creeks. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. In my hometown of Greenville, North Carolina, there's a place called Overton's. Overton's is the world's largest water sports dealer, and this is their 1985 discount catalog. Anything and everything that the boater will need is in this book. Whether it's water skis or life vests, fishing tackles, shotguns, or crossbows, Overton's in Greenville has it at discount prices. Call them today toll-free for your new free catalog, or stop by when you're in Greenville. The prices and selections are super. Tell them Frank sent you.
Hello, I'm Betty Herring. This summer, Workshop Theater is off to see the wizard. You're invited to join Dorothy and her dog Toto in Munchkinland and follow the yellow brick road to the Land of Oz. Won't you come and meet the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, Cowardly Lion, the Good Witch, and the Wicked Witch of the West? This delightful family musical, The Wizard of Oz, will open July 12th. Please call Workshop Theater 799-6551 for reservations. Wise guy. <laughs> from now on, you just better stay as far away from Mayberry as you can get if you know what's good for you. You're gonna get the drop on me again. It feeds your follicle. <laughs> Good. Listen to the ingredients. Water, soybean oil, egg yolk, cheese, and lemon. Wow. I never fed my hair that well. <laughs> Maybe it's why it left me. It's a water ski uh, company, and they have a water ski catalog, which is practically all water ski equipment, but has some marine uh, hardware and stuff like that in it. So uh, I've got an idea when you call the toll-free number that if you ask them, uh, they'll send you both of the catalogs. So if you want one of this, it, they've got some great stuff in here and good prices. Uh, we'll see you here next week. Please do not litter and do yourself a favor. Take a kid fishing. The Southern Sportsman has been brought to you in part by House Autry Cornmeal and Flour Products. By Happy Jack. Manufacturer of the all-new 3X flea collar. By Overton's, the world's largest water sports dealer. And by the Southern Sportsman Restaurant, the best foods from the field and the ocean. This summer, Harbison Recreation Center presents sight, sounds, and entertainment to dazzle the young and the young at heart. Friday, July 19th, Greco the Great will perform feats of magic, levitation, illusions, and sights and sounds to delight the senses. Friday, August 2nd, we will bring you the Lynch Puppet Theater's Southern Fried version of Red Riding Hood, You All. The theatrical portion of Camp Have Some Fun, combined with these special performances, will lay the groundwork for Little Kittle Theater this fall. Join us for these super special events. Call 781-2281 for individual, group, and special family rates. Tickets available the day of the performance and phone reservations are accepted. We welcome you to our wonderful world of recreation. Jefferson's, 7.30 weeknights.